Massive flooding in China is raising concerns that the Three Gorges Dam could collapse. But one Chinese expert refuted the claims, saying the dam is sound enough to withstand an atomic bomb. The U.S. ordered the Chinese consulate to close in Houston, Texas, giving Chinese consulate staff 72 hours to get out of the country. The staff were seen burning documents in the yard at the back of the building. Pompeo said President Trump has said enough over China's intellectual property theft. The Secretary of State will give a China policy speech tomorrow, which he says will make sure Americans fully understand the threats of the CCP and explain the new policies. Capital outflows in China reached a four-year high. Nearly 140 billion U.S. dollars in indirect investment funds flowed out of China in the second quarter. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a powerful storm quickly turned day into night. That says unusual weather seems to be plaguing China. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The U.S. has ordered the Chinese consulate in Houston to close, accusing China of spying. Consulate staff were ordered to leave in 72 hours or face arrests. An expert calls it a turning point in the U.S.-China policy. The United States asks Chinese consulate staff in Houston to get out of the country by 4 p.m. this Friday. The State Department said the closure is to protect U.S. intellectual property and Americans' private information. It accuses the Chinese regime of violating U.S. sovereignty and intimidating American people. China called the move an unprecedented escalation and said it would retaliate. Reuters reported that Beijing could close the U.S. consulate in Wuhan, though most diplomats already left the city when the virus broke out. Social media videos show people burning documents on the consulate grounds. Acting chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee Marco Rubio said the closure needed to happen. It's kind of the central node of a massive spy operation, commercial espionage, defense espionage, also influence agents to try to influence Congress. U.S. Justice Department on Tuesday charged two Chinese hackers over cyber espionage that targeted defense contractors and virus vaccine research. The first time that the U.S. accusing the hackers are backed by the Chinese regime. A China affairs commentator said the move to close the consulate marks a turning point in the U.S. foreign policy principle towards China. He said in the past, the U.S. would often take into account how angry the Chinese regime will be or how they will react before making any major foreign policy decisions. This was considerate of the so-called culture of saving face of the Chinese regime. But this is exactly what has been taken advantage of by the CCP. And one result of that is the CCP has gained the upper hand in terms of influencing U.S. foreign policy. But this time is different. It shows a significant change in the guiding principles of U.S. foreign policy. That is, the U.S. does not care about the feelings of the CCP anymore, nor does it care how the CCP will react. In other words, the U.S. foreign affairs behavior and decisions are based solely on America's national interest. Recently, multiple top administration officials openly caught the Chinese regime out for its misbehaviors. The FBI is opening a new China-related counterintelligence case about every 10 hours. Of the nearly 5,000 active FBI counterintelligence cases currently underway across the country, almost half are all related to China. The CCP has launched an orchestrated campaign across all of its many tentacles in Chinese government and society to exploit the openness of our institutions in order to destroy them. This is actually the normal model and the normal interaction between two countries, because the two sides are truly equal and reciprocal. This is not the first time that the U.S. has closed foreign consulates. President Trump closed a Russian consulate in San Francisco three years ago and staff of the Japanese consulate in Washington, D.C. burned papers and documents in the backyard of their building in 1941 before the Pearl Harbor attack. Penny Jo, NTD News. Speaking on a visit to Denmark, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said China's theft of U.S. and European intellectual property had gone on a long time, saying that President Trump has said enough. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the Trump administration is taking action to stop long-running intellectual property theft by the Chinese Communist Party, which he says has cost Europeans and Americans hundreds of thousands of jobs. President Trump has said enough. 
we're not going to we're, we're not going to allow this to continue to happen where they you've seen the remarks that uh, National Security Advisor O'Brien gave that FBI Director Ray gave and that Attorney General Barr has given. We, we are setting out clear expectations for how the Chinese Communist Party is going to behave. And when they don't, we're going to take actions that protect the American people, protect our security, our national security, and also protect our economy and jobs. Uh, that's the actions that you're seeing taken by President Trump. We'll continue to engage in those. Pompeo is set to give a policy speech on China on Thursday. This will be the fourth in a series of addresses by top Trump administration officials. He told the Washington Times in an interview that it's going to be a series of remarks aimed at making sure the American people understand the ongoing serious threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. As powerful flooding continues to plague southern China, concerns are rising that the country's famous Three Gorges Dam could collapse. But some Chinese experts have dismissed the claims, with one of them adding that even an atomic bomb couldn't destroy the massive structure. NDD's Juliet Song reports. Concerns are rising over whether the Three Gorges Dam could collapse amid China's massive flooding, but Chinese experts are quick to refute. In a state media interview, one expert said even an atomic bomb couldn't entirely destroy the dam, adding that it would only blow a hole in it. Another expert said water won't erode the dam, as it's made of concrete and only gets stronger with time. But one of the most prominent experts on the dam says otherwise. Hydrologist Wang Wei Luo wrote that when air interacts with concrete, a chemical process called carbonation happens. That means that concrete will gradually erode as a result. Wang has been sounding the alarm about the dam's stability for the past decade. He says it was poorly constructed. China started building the dam in 1994. Four years later, the country saw some of its worst flooding in recent decades. Concerned about the dam's quality, China's then-premier hired Western experts to inspect the structure. One of them said the steel bar welding of the dam wasn't up to standard, but the comments upset the Chinese workers, who complained that the Western experts' criticism was a form of racial discrimination. Yet, the criticism came too late. The steel bar welding and cement pouring of the gorge's left bank is all complete. They can't redo it. Wang explained the dam's construction team didn't include a separate group for quality inspection. The team that designed the dam did it themselves. Last Saturday, after the dam saw its highest level of flooding yet this year, Chinese authorities admitted the dam has moved, leaked, and distorted. The report published by Chinese media didn't give specific numbers, instead stressing that all major parameters are within normal range. In 2002, another report revealed that the dam had many cracks, including some of them large enough to be the width of an adult's hand. A construction worker told the reporter that the cracks emerged because some construction materials, including the base of the dam, had problems. One of the dam's construction team leaders later responded saying it's impossible to avoid cracks, but that those on the Three Gorges Dam are non-threatening. Juliet Song, NCD News. A band of rainstorms in China is moving northward. Authorities in the central Chinese province of Henan issued a yellow-level severe weather warning on Wednesday, ahead of the storm's impact. It's the second most serious warning level. Forecasters say the area may receive two inches or more of rain within six hours and may continue after that. The Yellow River's flow rate reached 3,000 cubic meters per second Monday, which marks this year's second wave of flooding. Online video shows some streets in Henan are already submerged beneath around five feet of water in some areas. Floodwaters have even found their way into trucks and buses. Locals have been seen driving cars that look more like they're driving boats, while others wade through the high waters. Now we turn to another area of the country. Widespread flooding has become a common scene in China over the last two months. But this time, it's not in southern and central China. Instead, it's in Harbin, a northeastern city. On Wednesday, a sudden downpour hit the city, accompanied by thunder, lightning, strong winds and hailstones. The storm downed trees and waterlogged some sections of the city. 
Netizens reported that the hail was strong enough to damage their glass windows at home. Some of the hailstones were the size of golf balls. Despite it being only 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the storm quickly turned day into night as it rolled in. The inclement weather brought a reminder of the Communist Party's two sessions held back in May. The event marks one of China's most important political events. On the first day of the event, the sky suddenly turned black at around 3 in the afternoon, accompanied by powerful thunder and lightning. That storm immediately sparked internet buzz as comments flooded in online. Now to China's economy. According to the latest report from Standard Chartered Bank, over 40 billion U.S. dollars in indirect investment funds flowed out of China in June. That says the second quarter reached nearly 140 billion U.S. dollars, a record high since the fourth quarter of 2016. Experts say these capital outflows include trade credit, loans, currency, and deposits. They appear to reflect concerns about the strained Washington-Beijing relationship, particularly after the CCP implemented its draconian national security law over Hong Kong. It's now widely seen as a threat to the city's freedom and to its autonomy as a world financial hub. In response, the United States has introduced a series of sanctions against the CCP. The tensions also extend to other areas as well, including the pandemic. Taiwan's foreign minister warned on Wednesday China's military threat is on the rise. This comes after a recent spike in Chinese military drills near the island. Taiwan is a self-ruling island with its own democratic system, but China has vowed to unify it with the mainland, threatening eventual force. Taiwan's defense ministry in June reported eight incidents of intrusion of Chinese military planes in its air defense identification zone, in which Taiwan jets gave radio warnings to usher the intruders out of the airspace. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper said on Tuesday the U.S. won't back down in selling arms to Taiwan. He added the U.S. will remain committed to regional peace and security, saying China is the one aggravating the situation with Taiwan. The defense chief also touched on a number of topics in his speech on Tuesday. Esper said he's hoping to visit China by the end of the year to work on crisis communications channels. He added it would be his first such visit as secretary and the meeting would be to enhance cooperation on areas of common interest. As part of President Trump's hardline stance towards Beijing, experts said the U.S. will continue sending Navy ships into the South China Sea. The waters have been highly contested lately as Beijing made increasingly aggressive moves into the international waters. Experts said China has bullied regional nations and allies out of over $2.5 trillion in potential offshore oil and gas revenue. Esper said China has no right to turn international waters into a zone of exclusion for its own maritime empire. He added the U.S. wants to deter against coercive behavior. Beijing has objected to such moves, calling it a rejection of its claims in the area. Esper also said the U.S. is committed to uphold its pledge to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific. To do so, the U.S. has partnered with Australian and Japanese warships. The group conducted joint military exercises in the waters. And the U.S. and India joined forces in the Indian Ocean, conducting military drills there. Esper also highlighted the increased defense cooperation with India, one of the all-important defense relationships of the 21st century. When asked about the India-China border conflict, Esper said the U.S. is closely monitoring what's happening at the border. This comes after a border clash between soldiers from the two countries, which left 20 Indian soldiers dead. Esper added the U.S. was very pleased to see both sides are trying to de-escalate the situation. An Arizona senator is looking to ban federal funds from being used to buy products from companies backed by the Chinese regime. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on that proposal and others from senators who want the U.S. to be less dependent on communist China. Republican Arizona Senator Martha McSally introduced two bills, bills that would ban federal funds from being used to buy Chinese Communist Party type products like subway trains. An increasing concern in Washington is U.S. infrastructure built with Chinese technology that puts national security at risk. Under China's law, Chinese companies must hand over collected data regardless of where it's collected to the regime if it asks for it. 
McSally expressed concerns during a committee hearing over how lenient the U.S. can be about trading with China. We have China bidding for public transportation bids in major American cities. We have China supplying drones uh, to uh, local law enforcement uh, and uh, other entanglements on the stock market with double standards and not having the same kind of oversight. So, But senators are looking to take things a step further. Republican Senator Tom Cotton is also considering the idea of banning certain Chinese companies like Huawei, China Mobile, and others from operating in the U.S. President Trump's former deputy assistant for national security says this absolutely should happen. Absolutely. These are companies that are... Uh state-owned enterprises. They are fronts for the Chinese military. Not only should we bar them from operating in the United States, lobbyists who represent them in Washington should um, have to explain that. Democratic Senator Menendez says he's opposed to the idea of any further trade deals with China and instead wants the U.S. to invest in its own infrastructure to better compete with China. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom held a hearing about the Chinese regime's use of technology to oppress religious groups. They say China has created a surveillance state on a scale that was never seen before. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USCIRF, held a virtual hearing about technological surveillance of religion in China. USCIRF says the Chinese Communist Party has created an Orwellian surveillance state with an unmatched ability to gather information about its citizens. According to the commission, the CCP has installed hundreds of millions of surveillance cameras across the country, some even inside churches. It's done to track the movements of Uyghurs and Tibetans using facial and voice recognition. But one panel member says the two minorities aren't the only ones falling under the party's surveillance. Panelist Chris Maserol says although Tibet and the Xinjiang are the most extreme examples, the CCP has also relied on digital surveillance to target Christians as well as spiritual movements like Falun Gong. Falun Gong, also called Falun Dafa, is a spiritual meditation practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. The Chinese regime brutally persecutes those who practice it. Likewise, the CCP also monitors the Twitter-like WeChat app, as well as other social media platforms for religious content. One panel member noted that numerous Tibetans have been arrested or detained for sharing photos of spiritual Tibetan leader the Dalai Lama. But he added that the CCP's online censorship doesn't only affect people living in China. For companies like WeChat and TikTok that are expanding their censorship and surveillance beyond China's borders, helping Beijing erode global human rights standards. Recently, the House voted to ban Chinese video sharing app TikTok on federal devices. The move came amid fears that data collected by the app and sent to the Chinese regime could be used in a cyber attack against the U.S. The U.K. says the path to citizenship for about 3 million Hong Kongers will open in 2021. It comes in response to Beijing imposing a oppressive new law on Hong Kong. Our correspondent in London, Jane Wirrell, has more. The U.K. released details of its visa plans, which is often referred to as a lifeboat for Hong Kong citizens. About 3 million Hong Kongers are eligible. The Home Secretary said in a statement that the offer is open to BNO passport holders and their dependents. Children over 18 not normally considered dependents may also be considered. She said they do not need to have a job before coming to the UK and there will be no skills tests or minimum income requirements. The UK has said they will stand by the people of Hong Kong. We have to think about the, the human rights, the, the rights of the people of Hong Kong to participate in democratic processes and people here uh, from Hong Kong and how, that, how those changes affect them. Prominent pro-democracy protester Nathan Law fled to London this month and earlier this week met with Mike Pompeo in the UK. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. Hong Kong students in the UK, once very vocal, are now staying silent during political discussions about China. The recent CCP-imposed Hong Kong national security law has imposed a level of self-censorship on Hong Kong students studying in England. Speaking anonymously to The Times, students at five UK universities said they didn't feel safe anymore openly sharing their opinions. 
One Warwick student said, The new law strips us of all sense of security to speak without fear of being arrested or abused and have the personal safety of our friends and family compromised. French authorities are effectively phasing Huawei out of the country's mobile networks. They told telecom companies that the government won't renew licenses for Huawei's 5G equipment when they expire. Most of these licenses are for three or five years. France's cybersecurity agency urged those not currently using Huawei gear to avoid switching to it. The Japanese government is paying 87 companies to leave China and bring manufacturing home or relocate to a country in Southeast Asia. It'll cost over half a billion dollars. 30 companies are taking production to places like Laos, Vietnam and Malaysia. The other 57 are bringing production home. More are expected to follow in phase two of the effort. Japan allocated over $2 billion this year to make it happen. The country had trouble getting critical supplies like masks early on in the outbreak. The subsidies will help Japan build resilient supply chains and reduce reliance on China. U.S.-China relations are their lowest point in decades. China's handling of the CCP virus, as well as aggressive wolf warrior style of diplomacy, are disturbing Western countries. Despite the high tensions, China is celebrating what it calls the triumph of the Chinese leader's diplomacy. A new state-owned institute, dubbed Xi Jinping Thought and Diplomacy Study Center, was founded in Beijing earlier this week. In China, the Xi Center is now thought to surpass all four previous generations of CCP leaders. That's because a party leader has never before dared to put himself on such a high pedestal. China's foreign minister Wang Yi made a speech during the institute's opening ceremony. In it, he made many complimentary remarks, including that Xi thought promotes common good and universal peace. But not everyone seems to agree. Jiang Feng, a U.S.-based political commentator, questions whether Xi really cares about the common good of mankind. And at the initial stages of the CCP virus outbreak, why he closed off one entire province inside China. He had allowed international flights to continue service to other countries. Tens of thousands of word combinations related to Chinese leader Xi Jinping are censored on the Chinese internet. The goal is to eliminate every negative voice about the leader of the Chinese Communist Party or CCP. And that only makes up a fraction of the party's sensitive word bank. Uh, a former Chinese web censor, Liu Lipong, gave us an internal document containing more than 35,000 word combinations, spanning over 700 pages. Every term on the list is related to Xi Jinping. All negative comments that use the words will be deleted to maintain the leader's so-called positive image. The censorship system first filters all posts that contain sensitive words. Some will then be deleted immediately without being reviewed. Others will be looked at manually by web censors, who then decide whether or not to delete them. But the list of sensitive terms is still growing. For now, it's a race between web users and censors. The more words that are added to the list, the more expressions users create to avoid censorship. Those new terms are then added to the sensitive word bank, and the cycle continues. Since Xi Jinping is deemed a sensitive word, Chinese web users have come up with substitute names for him, including Winnie the Pooh, Xi Chairman, Xi Core, and Xi Boss, among others. Some even dare to use mocking nicknames like Xi the Sun. That's because in China, Sun is a metaphor for all communist leaders, like Mao Zedong. Another nickname, Baozi, or steamed bun, has gone viral online. The name was sparked by a story from back in 2013. That's when a netizen accidentally encountered Xi as he stood in line and spent $3 for lunch in a steamed bun restaurant. The netizen later posted about it online. The encounter soon generated major internet buzz and was even reported by the CCP state-run media outlets, as lining up in person is a rare occurrence for CCP leaders. The media aimed to use the incident to build Xi's image as a leader of the people, but instead it became a laughingstock, based on how it was clearly a staged event. As a result, the term steamed bun or bun became a nickname for Xi. Other sensitive words and phrases are also similarly related to specific people, events, or even curses. Examples include bedbugs, loser, no bottom line, last emperor, assassination, and overthrow. If Xi's name is used in combination with any of these words in an online post, it will be filtered. 
Events or locations are also noted on the list. For example, the term Causeway Bay of Hong Kong. It refers to the freedom of speech in Hong Kong and Tianjin Harbor. More specifically, it's a reference to the 2015 Tianjin explosion that, according to official figures, cured nearly 200 people. Other more ordinary topics, seemingly without special meaning, are also deemed sensitive. They include terms like G20 meeting, nuclear station, political reform, and divorce. If online comments are made about these events or expressions and they mention the Chinese leader, they'll be filtered out and put into a pool for review by web censors. Authorities now have over 35,000 word combinations used to filter comments about Xi Jinping online. As Liu Lipeng said, as for censoring free speech in China, this is only the tip of the iceberg. Reporting by Xu Wenhui, NTD News. Following a months-long lockdown, some New Yorkers have decided they don't want to go through it again in a city that's known for its crowds. The need for more space has sent real estate sales booming outside the five boroughs. New Yorkers, anxious about enduring another pandemic in the crowds and small apartments of New York City, are feeling a boom in home sales and rentals upstate. Real estate brokers and agents describe a booming market recently since many are now able to work from home. Anil and Joyce Lilly belong to the group of house hunters that are working remotely. They just bought a house an hour north in the Hudson Valley. That way, if the outbreak roars back into the city, they won't be sheltering in their Bronx apartment. I think the pandemic um, really caused the glue to hold the, the commitment we had to Manhattan to fall away. Although many New Yorkers are taking similar steps, New York City is in no danger of hollowing out any time soon. The upstate wave looks more like a trickle in a city of over 8 million, with new homes in the region ranging from $200,000 to more than $1 million, they're an escape hatch many cannot afford. But the spike in sales and long-term rentals suggests New Yorkers who endured the worst of the pandemic see the city as less hospitable. Agents say people are now fighting bidding wars over homes that have been sitting on the market for a long time before the pandemic and new listings are being snapped up fast by buyers with cash. There are now close to 4 million CCP virus cases in the U.S. That's about 1 percent of the population. California, Florida and Texas have the most right now. Conversation about school reopenings continues. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the latest updates about the situation. Latest data from the CDC shows that over the past couple of weeks, the nation has seen around 60,000 new virus cases per day. Deaths nationwide have reached more than 140,000. To put that into perspective, about 1% of the U.S. population has tested positive for the virus, and of those cases, about 3% have died from it. California has the highest number of current cases in the country. Now Los Angeles may be on the brink of a second lockdown, the mayor has warned, if the situation doesn't improve there. As for school, both Los Angeles and San Diego have already decided they will not hold in-person classes at the start of the school year. Quite the opposite situation in Florida. The Board of Education issued an emergency order to have schools reopen at least five days per week, staying consistent with safety precautions. But then, a teachers' union filed a lawsuit to sue the governor and the Board of Education over the order. If a teacher does not feel comfortable there and they want to maybe do their job distance, if that's what's comfortable... And I think he said it's obvious that some parts of the state have more severe situations than others and that ultimately, parents should have the chance to choose what's best for their kids. And Vice President Mike Pence says school reopening is a priority. There, there are almost greater risks to children not being in school than there are to children being in school. Pence says there is bipartisan support for a $30 billion fund for state education efforts. And he says that negotiation discussions are starting this week about a new relief package, with funding for schools to reopen safely high on the priority list. Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. Texas's daily CCP virus count is right behind the nation's second-highest, Florida's. But the Texas governor appears to be against a second lockdown. He overruled a county that wants residents to stay home. He says social distancing and masks are good enough to keep businesses open. And the governor of Florida says the virus situation in the state is improving. He is planning to reopen schools for in-class instructions. 
Florida's Republican governor said the state was on the upswing in its battle to contain the pandemic. Like Georgia and Texas, Florida has recently seen record hospitalizations of around 10,000 per day. Florida has become the focal point of the latest virus surge. That triggered the state's teachers' union to sue Republican Governor Ron DeSantis over his plan to reopen schools for in-class instruction. But DeSantis is positive about the state's future. So these things, these things take time, but I do think that um, uh, I think the trend is much better today than the trend was, than the trend was uh, two weeks ago. DeSantis said over the weekend that virus positivity rates in emergency room visits have been lower in recent weeks. Statewide, 24 percent of the hospital beds in the state of Florida are empty. Uh, that's over 14,000 hospital beds, and about 20 percent of the ICU beds uh, are empty. Neither Florida nor Georgia have issued statewide mask mandates. Texas's Abbott initially resisted requiring masks, but earlier this month agreed to mandate them in most counties. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching, and see you tomorrow.